Hello, and welcome to the Curious Artist Podcast. This is a show for artists and art lovers where I interview a diverse group of artists in order to get at the deep questions of the art world. On this episode, I interview Heidi Parks. Heidi is a fiber artist living in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Specialized in quilts and mending, she uses her art to explore memory, improvisation, and collaboration. She's a graduate from the School of Art Institute of Chicago. To learn more about her and the things we talked about on this show, you can find the show notes at thecuriousartist.com slash 001. Hi, this is Carly here. Uh, I'm with Heidi Parks in her home studio, and I'm, I thought maybe we should, you should introduce yourself, tell me a little bit about you, your background, what you do, uh, what brings you up to this point. Yeah, well, Carly, I'm very pleased to be here. I am a local fiber artist here in Milwaukee, so I focus mostly on making quilts. They're hand quilted, and before that, I was living in Chicago. Before that, I was a high school art teacher in Naperville, Illinois, for nine years, and I'm a graduate of the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. I studied art education, fiber art, drawing, and ceramics while I was a student there. I come from a very creative family. My mother's from Milwaukee. My dad's from the Chicago area. And so my dad's a woodworker. My mom has done a lot of cooking and canning and jamming. Uh, My grandmother, who lived in Milwaukee for a very long time, was a ceramic artist and and has a degree in art from University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. So I come from a wonderfully creative family. My brother's a photographer. Uh, So that's a little bit about where I come from and what I'm doing. Interesting. So you you come from a very creative family, it sounds Mm -hmm. like. Where did you grow up? I didn't catch that part. Yeah, I grew up in Naperville, Illinois. Ah. So I was born in Chicago and lived in Oak Park for five years. And then right before starting kindergarten, we moved to Naperville in the Ah. suburbs of Chicago. Interesting. Anyway, so how was attending the Art Institute of Chicago? I loved going to the Art Institute. That uh, It's one of the best choices I ever made was to go there. I was deciding between different types of schools. So that was the art school that I applied to. I also applied to um, University of Illinois. I applied to Augustana College, more of a smaller liberal arts school. And ultimately, I decided that I knew I wanted to study art. I wasn't feeling indecisive between art and other subjects or other topics. And so I thought the best place to study art and to really learn how to teach art best and how to make art best was to go to an art school. I also, at the time in high school and throughout college, I was an assistant to a ceramic artist in Naperville. And she was a graduate of the School of the Art Institute. So I got to hear a lot of wonderful things from her about the school, and I got to create a clearer picture in my mind of what it meant to choose to go to an art school instead of a state school. At the Art Institute, at the time, they had a first-year program where we were introduced to all of the different types of arts. We had a 2D art, 3D art, and a 4D art class, and we also got to take our choice of other elective art class. And so I chose a class called Many Hands that was about collaborative art. And it's amazing how um, how much even that class has really influenced me as I've, I've progressed as an artist. When I was a teacher, I did a lot of collaborative work with my students. And even right now as a fiber artist, I'm doing two quilts that are collaborative. I'm making a quilt with Luke Haynes in Los Angeles and a quilt with Joe Cunningham in San Francisco. And I'm working on a quilt upcoming that's going to be about aging and the aging process, about trying to... um, looking closer at the way that we restrain age and perhaps if we weren't trying to hide the fact that we were aging all of the time. And so I'm doing that with Kyrie Carpenter and the changing aging um, group that she works with. So um, lots of collaboration. And that was really something that I learned about and was first introduced to at the Art Institute of Chicago. It was incredible there to go to class. And in my Asian art survey class, we would go and spend an hour each evening at the art museum. And so if we were talking about Japanese scrolls, we would be looking at them. Or if we were talking about 
um, ceramics or, or, or any of the different subjects, sculptures of the Buddha, we got to go and see them in person. And there was so much passion in my professor at talking about those works of art in front of them. It's so different to get to see the real thing in person. Um, and then there are a lot of intangibles too. For example, during lunch, a lot of the times I would try to go in the museum and just walk around and really touch base, like find my anchor again. Like, why am I here? What is it that I love about art? What moves me and is a passion for me? And so I found a lot of the time I would gravitate towards going to sit by the big orange Mark Rothko painting at the Art Institute. At the time, they had a nice bench in front of it, and so you could just sit and that was a favorite place of mine to reflect and enjoy the painting and kind of get lost in it. And that was one of the great joys of going to a school that was physically connected to an art museum. That's amazing. <laughs> I sometimes I wish I'd gone to some some other school. <laughs> I forget. Where did you go? I went to UWM. Well, first I went to UWM for linguistics. Mm -hmm. I didn't have the courage you did to go to, for art originally. Mm -hmm. And I graduated with a degree in linguistics. And then I went back to school for art, but unfortunately I hit the $50,000 borrowing limit and I was not willing to purchase more, <laughs> yeah. get more in debt. So I decided to become an artist, basically, to mm -hmm. jump in. Yeah. I as soon as I wonder. Mm -hmm. I was very lucky because, as you mentioned, I do come from a very creative family. And so people had a lot of experience with art. And actually my, my mother and father both decided not to pursue art as a career, my dad went to school for engineering and worked with computers for his career. And my mother was a very talented artist, especially at drawing, but she wanted to be a veterinarian. And then she really bombed at that. She was <laughs> terrible in chemistry. She got, she failed it a couple of times at University of Wisconsin-Madison and then decided to go instead into the food business. And so as I was choosing to pursue art, there was certainly a healthy amount of caution, but also a healthy amount of passion and people who understood what it meant to be an artist. And so my mom and I when I was young, would do things like the Myers-Briggs test and oh. personality testing. And we would talk through and think about what is the lifestyle like? I remember that my other big passion as a high schooler was for theater. And so as we were talking through that, I began to really think about what does it mean to live a life in theater? And I thought, I don't want to always work in the evenings and on the weekends and have a gig for three months or for a year or have to travel with the, with the performance. Uh, I just felt like I wanted a life that felt different from that, even though I had a passion for theater. And so then when I thought about what my life would be like as an artist, I was working for a ceramic artist and I knew what that meant to be in a ceramic studio, in a home studio, and see the same two people every day, and listen to the radio all the time, and work kind of hunched over alone making things. And I felt like at the time that wasn't what I wanted either. And so for me, becoming an art teacher was a wonderful mix of getting to make art and live my passion, but also being around people. And the fact that I would be able to get out of the house and see other human beings during the day at the time was a real priority for me. And so it was just that that self-knowledge and really you know, taking tests and, and having my mother, who I trusted to talk with and, and work through that. And, and also my mentor, the, ceramics te the ceramic artist that I was working for, yeah. she was invaluable as well for talking about what do I want my life to be like after college and trying to plan efficiently which school felt right for me and which major felt right for me. Nice. Mm -hmm. uh, that brings around a, a couple more questions. <laughs> I've got a lot. <laughs> sure. You, when you were teaching art, what you were teaching it to what grade? I was a high school art teacher. High school. So what, what did you gain from that experience and why have you decided not to do that anymore? Sure. So I was a high school art teacher at a very large school. It was um, Nikua Valley High School, a wonderful school, very top-ranked school. And we had over 4,000 students. 
And so we had a separate building for the freshmen where we had about a thousand students in the freshman building. And most of the time it was my job to teach in that freshman building. So I really specialize in the niche group of 14 to 15 year olds. Those are my people. I understand them. I feel what they feel (laughs) Uh, and had a great time teaching them. What I especially loved about the high school freshmen is the fact that they know it will be different. They know that high school is not junior high, but they don't know in what way it will be different. And so if I said an artist uses a sketchbook and they draw once a week, they believed me (laughs) and they created that as a habit that meant something to them. Whereas if you wait till a student's 18 and they don't think they're going to have any homework in art class, like it can be like pulling teeth to get them to actually spend some time making art in their free time. And I think that that's a very important way of getting a sense of, do you love art or do you not? Are you willing to spend 30 minutes or an hour of your free time making art? And then is that pleasant or does that feel like drudgery? So it was fun to get to help students realize if they had a passion for art or if they didn't, and to cultivate a lot of creativity. One of my main hopes was not to create hundreds and hundreds of artists, but to create a couple thousand students who value the arts and who are able to think creatively and to come up with their own ideas and to be problem solvers, because that we need in every career. And so if I'm thinking about the doctor that I want putting stitches on my heart during surgery, I want that to be someone with an eye for detail, someone who perhaps learned how to draw with me and knows how to really look and see things and who knows how to pay attention to those smaller details. And when I'm thinking of a business person, I don't want them to just do the first thing that pops into their mind. I want them to really carefully consider and brainstorm in a sketchbook or a notebook. What are all of the possibilities, all of the things that I could do for my business? How could I advertise? How could I pay employees ethically? How could I get customers to be invested in my product? There's more than one answer to all of those questions. And I think that one of my goals as an art teacher was to help students to think big in ways that are important and in ways that are creative, because I think that creativity is a muscle and a learned skill just as much as being good at giving speeches in speech class and just as good as much as being a good driver, that Mm -hmm. that's something that you can learn and cultivate within yourself to be good at. What have you personally taken away from that experience? Um, So for me as a high school art teacher, I really got to see everyone. And that was unique because previously in high school and college, you're mostly just around your friends. You never have to work with everyone or know everyone. And so it was very revealing and interesting for me to get to work with all of the different students and to see what was going on. It was also interesting to see the students who struggled at art and to see, um, you know, the same way that sports are hard for me. (laughs) There there are kids where, where art is not necessarily easy for everyone. And so it was a really good opportunity for me to see that and to realize like, oh, I do have some real talent here. And it's not something that I should be taking for granted or assuming that everyone has, because they don't. We each have unique talents. So that's something that I got. I think that being around 14-year-olds all the time keeps you young and keeps you excited about new things and current. And I, I would joke that you know, by, by osmosis, I was staying young and youthful by being around the kids. I also developed a passion for yoga, really because I was an art teacher. And so There was a semester where school was really difficult for me. I was traveling between two different high schools and just pulled in many directions, as I'm sure a lot of people can guess. Being an art teacher and being a teacher in general can be a very stressful job. And so I ended up searching out yoga as a means to create some more balance in my life so that I could take care of myself so that then I could be a better teacher. And then that ended up... I would sometimes talk to my students about my passion for yoga and how wonderful it had been for me. And ultimately ended up being a sponsor for a yoga club for the kids. And then once we ran out of teachers volunteering to teach a good free class, 
um, I started teaching. I thought I know how to teach. I know how to do yoga. I'll give it a whirl on these guinea pigs. <laughs> and it ended up being really wonderful. And they supported me as I learned more about yoga. And ultimately, I decided to invest in myself and pay the money to become a certified vinyasa instructor and to become then a certified yoga therapist. And it was exciting to go through both of those trainings and then come back and every Tuesday teach yoga at yoga club and share that knowledge that I was learning with the students. So, you know, in an, in an interesting way, being an art teacher led me to a new passion for yoga. Being an art teacher really created, I had several students who went on to go to the art institute and then graduated and they're artists and working in the creative field. And that's, I think, a beautiful thing for a lot of teachers is to get to see your students be successful and continue on with that thing that, um, that both of you love. I think you were asking, too, why did I stop teaching? And I was a teacher for nine years, and I think maybe it's generational. I'm right on the cusp. I'm a net gen or a <laughs> gen millennial, I guess. Yes, I'm a millennial. And so it just felt like after nine years of teaching, I had learned a lot in life about being a teacher, but was more teaching going to create more of value in my life and the lives of others, or was more teaching just more? And it started to feel like teaching more would be just more, and that I wanted to have more life experiences and try more things and do new things. And I think, especially because I was talking about creativity all day, talking about looking at life differently, certainly in my yoga training too, we really talk a lot about what are our values, what do we believe in, what are we interested in. And so it felt right to me to try something different and to just see how, how big life could be and what else, what else might be out there for me. And is was that recently with you last year or the year before that, or is that right before you moved to Milwaukee or that was two years ago. Okay. So I left teaching and I moved to Chicago and I reconnected with the art Institute and took advantage of a lot of the alumni support that they have. So they, for free, they met with me one-on-one -on -one and gave me advice. They had every other weekend support workshops that were on things like how to develop your website, how to create a social media presence, how to write your resume, how to give an elevator pitch, how to do your artist statement. And that was incredible because even had I studied those things 10 years prior at the Art Institute, there have been incredible technological advances since then. Not to date myself too terribly, but I applied to art school with slides. So <laughs> you can imagine it's a slightly different world, and it was wonderful to get help uh, with that. And, and it was nice to reconnect with Chicago. I had lived there as a student, and it felt nice to be in a neighborhood and connecting with other people I had gone to school with. But ultimately, I felt like long-term... Milwaukee kept singing its siren song to me. My mother's from here. I grew up always visiting Milwaukee and spending time with my aunt who lived in River West and my grandparents who lived here, my uncle who lived here. And so in particular, I love the size of Milwaukee. It's easy to get around the way that the Chicago suburbs are easy to get around, but there are things that I want to get around too and other creative people who are doing exciting things things the way that Chicago has. So it was very much the best of both worlds for me. Great. Now, I have some questions that I were, were the bulk of the interview now, mm -hmm. that are the bulk of the interview now. One thing that I really want this podcast to be about is art and what art means and what exactly it is and the role of the artist. So all that said, what is your definition of art right now? I like a big definition of art very much. And I, as an art teacher, I tried so much to help my students have a bigger definition of art and what art could be. And so in particular, when I listen to, when I watch PBS Craft in America, it's amazing to me to see people making art with street signs that they pull down and then they collage the way that Mark Bradford does. And to see Kai Kuo Kiang you know, using gunpowder to make explosions, to make drawings, and performance art, and uh, it just, just the huge breadth of what art can be. 
it's very inspiring to me. And I think in my particular field in general, I think that quilts have a history of being functional objects, of being blankets. And then in 2001, we found the Quilts of G's Bend, and those were exhibited at the Whitney and in Milwaukee and in other places. And people suddenly started to think, oh, if I'm making a quilt, it doesn't necessarily have to follow a traditional pattern. It could be any arrangement of color and shape that I want. And then we also began to think about it in terms of color field painting or color blocking and as a more of a painterly medium or as a medium that had potential to be very painterly. And so when I say that I'm a quilter, I am using fabric and sewing it together and hand quilting it. But I'm using a lot of my experience and training as an artist to really be a painter in that medium and to think about color and shape and telling a story and having an idea and a meaning come across to my viewer through my art. So is that what art is to you? Is Mm -hmm. telling a story? I'm just thinking you're getting at what... It's big. So art can be anything. And so I like the idea that right now I can be making a quilt and it can feel like a painting. And that when I look at Mark Bradford's collages, those to me feel like a painting. Mm -hmm. Or when I see Kai Kuo Kiang's explosions on paper, those feel like a painting. And so that the definition of art to me is now bigger and broader than what I've seen before. Okay, so you just think it's a big huge. definition. It's huge. You yeah. can't define it. It's so okay, big. Okay, I get what you're saying now. I thought, yeah. yeah. And so then what do you think an artist is then? An artist is someone who is driven to make, to create things. And also an artist is someone that's driven to express themselves, to create a shared experience to perhaps tell something very personal and connect it because then in telling something very personal, we actually realize how interconnected we are and how similar our life experiences can be. An artist is someone who chooses to have the title artist. (laughs) That's great. Now, then that, there's a question that I I had a year ago, I decided to take up the mantle and officially call myself an artist. Mm -hmm. When did you decide to do that? First of all, what was the decision like? And do you still feel the imposter syndrome behind it? Because I personally am like, no, I'm not really an artist. (laughs) (laughs) I'm calling myself an artist, but someone's going to find out I'm not really an artist. (laughs) Did you ever have that? You know, I think I remember back in first grade feeling very much like I was an artist. And my, you may remember that in first grade, they have something called the picture lady. And so at my school, yeah, at my school, my mother was the picture lady. And so she would come into my class and she would talk about art and paintings and do a little art history lesson for the students. And it was something that we did throughout the whole school. And so my mom was there talking about that. And I forget which artist she was talking about. Maybe it was Andrew Wyeth, but it's been a long time. (laughs) I forgive you. (laughs) And so whoever the artist was, she was talking about the fact that this artist was a third generation artist and that the grandfather and then the father and then the self, they were all artists and the art was in their family. And she was asked, my mom was asking if anyone knew anyone like that or had art in their family. And I think I timidly raised my hand and she's like, yeah, actually you are a third generation (laughs) artist. There are lots of artists in our family. And I think that, you know, as we search for identity when we're very, very young and some kids identify with being sporty or with being a good reader or with being, you know, a fan of Elmo. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> that that I identified very early as being an artist. And so when I was in fifth grade, I did a you know, the classic report on what do you plan to be when you grow up? And my my choice was art teacher. And then as I continued through school, I I always gravitated towards being an artist. And I didn't know that I would necessarily have a career as an artist, but I don't know that you have to pay your bills with art in order to be an artist, that they're not mutually exclusive, that like my parents, they are artists, but they are also in the food business and also in the computer business. And 
when I was in college, I had a wonderful opportunity to go on a study trip where we were studying outsider art. And we went to Germany, Switzerland, and Austria. Mm-hmm. And we studied with the art therapy program, the professors who were in art therapy. And so we got to see art that was made by people who weren't necessarily part of the quote art world. We got to see people who were in an insane asylum and they were driven to make something and they worked on it every day and they made things. And people, we met people who were differently abled, whether it was autism or Down syndrome or other, other things going on where they also present day went to the studio and made art every day. And they, some of them even make their living completely as an artist, completely self-sufficient. And so that there's no requirement to be an artist or to not be an artist in that traditional way that, that having the desire to make things and consistently showing up to make things consistently making time to make things that that is for me, one of the defining qualities of what is an artist and who is an artist. And that was something that to me is so beautiful and so clear when you look at outsider art Mm -hmm. and it's all about that raw passion and that very human desire to make things. And it doesn't matter if anyone else will see it and it doesn't matter if you get paid, it matters that, that you're making things and that you're expressing yourself. And so for me, that's a big part of having that, that kind of lifelong title of artist and owning that title and choosing, I, I am an artist because I consistently show up and make things in terms of starting to identify myself as a quilter. That one took a little more time, a little more of that, that struggle that you're, yeah. you're referring to where I made my first quilt in 2013. Right now it's 2016. That might be a pretty short amount of time for a person to go from having never made a quilt to being a quilter and mm-hmm. teaching at QuiltCon next year. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. For QuiltCon 17, um, Last year in February, I won two pretty cool awards. I won for best handwork and second place for improvisation. And so now this next year, I'll be teaching several classes and also teaching yoga at the quilt conference. And so somewhere in there, I felt like, okay, I think I'm a quilter. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, But when I had made like two or three quilts and I was starting to think about leaving, leaving teaching art and pursuing this new medium, that, that was certainly a word that I hesitated and my voice would kind of go up at the end. You know, the, I'm a quilter yeah. instead an of artist. I'm a quilter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah. And so certainly by now I feel very rooted in that and very comfortable. And I think it's that idea of showing up. I show up all the time. I make quilts all the time. I've made I don't know, probably 30 quilts at least. Um, mm-hmm. and I love your quilts. Thank you. Yeah. And so the, the hours that one spends, I think, add confidence to owning that title mm-hmm. and feeling like it fits and like it feels true. I forget what, what word did you should choose for imposter that. Imposter syndrome? Yeah. Yeah. That imposter idea. Like you, once you've done it enough, it, it fits and it feels very natural and very yeah. authentic. Interesting. That's like interesting. <laughs> we better work for that. <laughs> so I have a couple more questions. I mean, I have a bunch more questions, but mm-hmm. I ask these questions because I don't expect one right answer. I don't think there mm-hmm. is one right answer to any of these questions. Mm-hmm. But in our society today, what do you think is the role of art? How does art play a role in this hyper-connected, very fractured society that we live in? Mm-hmm. At least that's how I see it. Mm-hmm. So what is the role that art plays in our society today? I think in some ways... But when we look at the cave paintings, art has been an important part of life for a very long time, even back in the hunter-gatherer phase where Mm -hmm. life was very much just about survival or you would have thought it was just about survival. You find, and also in tribal communities today, you find that they have beautiful clothing and that they make paintings and drawings and do performance, you know, things that are mm-hmm. similar to performance art or to theater. And that it's one of those things that truly makes us human. That is very important. One of my favorite quotes is from Winston Churchill. 
and he was asked when they were fighting the war, why not cut the budget for the arts so that he could fund the war effort more? And he said, if we do that, what are we fighting for? That's great. It's really a powerful, powerful quote. And it makes me you know, proud that a leader would say that and that they would be aware of that and what that value that the arts have can contribute. And so when I look at our society today, and for example, when I look at you know, things like Obamacare, that was part of what gave me the courage to be an artist. Mm -hmm. My mother was self-employed and for years she had only cat catastrophic only health insurance because that's all she could afford when she was going out on her own. And that was being an independent business person in the food business. Certainly you know, well known that an artist is also a small business mm -hmm. and Having been an art teacher and having pretty decent health care, I knew how valuable that was to be able to care for my body. And so knowing that I could use the marketplace and have decent health care, even though I was self-employed, was an important thing that gave me the courage to be an artist. And so I think that, you know, a leader making a choice like that so that Ordinary people and artists and people who are self-employed can do that says something powerful about our society today and what it means to be an artist in our society today, that that is valued and that I felt like my government was helping me be able to make that choice, that that was becoming more and more of a reality for me. As I continue to think about the role that the arts play in our society today, something that I feel really passionate about is Instagram. And so for a long time, Instagram inspired me. And I was looking at account, I, you know, I realized, oh, I like this quilt thing that I'm doing. This feels good. <laughs> Life feels good when I'm quilting. And then I thought, is anyone else making a living as quilts? Is any With quilts, is anyone else making art that is a quilt. I just didn't know because I wasn't previously very aware of that part of the fiber art world. And so one of the resources that I had available to me was Pinterest and Instagram. And I was able to go on there and find people like Maura Grace Ambrose of Folk Fibers in Austin, Texas, and Luke Haynes in Los Angeles. And other artists, people who were showing up every day to make quilts and who were pushing that language forward and moving from a functional blanket into a work of art and something that could maybe be similar to a painting. And that is such a beautiful thing about our modern day. Instagram hasn't been around very long, and Instagram is something that gave me the courage to follow my dream and to feel like I had peers and people who were out there pursuing what I was pursuing. And so now Instagram is something that I love to interact with. I have, I have a few thousand followers. <laughs> Hello, <Congratulations>. everyone. <laughs> and so it's amazing for me to be able to sometimes post things with a question and say, hey, I'm doing this. What do you guys think? Mm -hmm. Because there's 3,500 3, people who might write back and yeah. say, actually, Heidi, I think I know the answer to that question. Um, I was able, the collaborations that I mentioned, I was able to connect with Luke and Joe about collaborating through Instagram. In Milwaukee, my collaborator, Kyrie, who is an advocate for aging, she and I found each other on Instagram. She moved to Milwaukee a little bit after I did. We were both posting things, hashtag quilt, hashtag <laughs> yoga. <laughs> and we ended up finding each other on Instagram and striking up a wonderful friendship. And so I think that you know, as much as you might see a lot of complication and difficulty in the modern age, I also see the government making huge strides to support people who are small businesses and artists. And I see access like we've never had before to creating creative communities for making a space where people feel empowered and connected and able to, to discuss things. And so one last note on Instagram is my friend Zach Foster. He lives in Brooklyn, and again, he and I found each other on Instagram, mm -hmm. and he's also a Spanish teacher, so we have teaching <laughs> in common, 
And he recently, a couple months ago, hosted me in New York to teach a mending class. And so I wanted to, I got hired to go teach a class in New Jersey. And I thought, oh, if I'm going that close, like, I want to also go to Brooklyn and New York. And so he hosted my mending class and we got to meet in person. And he right now is doing an incredible collaboration with over 43 artists. As a Spanish teacher, he was aware of 43 students who were studying to be teachers who were kidnapped by the police in Mexico. Uh, They were kidnapped over two years ago and we have not found them, but it's been a rallying cry in Mexico about people who are, who are disappearing and that that is no longer okay. And people are standing up about that and they, they don't want people to disappear anymore and they want the government to be accountable. And so each of us collaborators, I chose a name of someone and so did 42 other artists. And so I wrote the name of Giovanni Guerrero de la Cruz and I embroidered his portrait and I sent that to Zach and all the other artists sent the names in and they're being right now quilted together into a long banner about 20 feet long by four feet tall and we're going to send that to people in Mexico so that they can hold that banner when they're doing protests and when they are at at a peaceful rally because of these 43 missing students. And so I think that that's another incredible way that Instagram and that our our current modern society is able to use art for good. And so, you know, Zach is a great example of someone who's both a teacher and an artist, and he's using art not just to go in museums, but to be an important part of people's lives, that he's using art to help this cause to let families feel as though their voices are being heard as a reminder that these 43 young men are missed and that that you know gives me goosebumps that's such a powerful way that we can be using art and that art can be important beyond just the walls of a museum and a gallery now feel free to send me any links you have because i'm mm-hmm. going to write show notes for this so everything will be included in the show Definitely. notes for all these names that you're mentioning i'll, <laughs> I'll try and get sure. every, every one of them in, in their handles and stuff for instagram mm-hmm. yeah uh, so don't you don't need to mention them now because i'll just put them in the show notes so you can find mm-hmm. it at thecuriousartist.com mm-hmm. slash zero zero one but great because it'll be the first episode cool i've decided <laughs> <laughs> yeah i so many questions that brings to mind so building the audience along with the body work, I mean, that's a very impressive. You got like a thousand followers or three thousand, three thousand five hundred. Numbers, yeah. numbers just do not <laughs> stick in my head. Three thousand more, even more impressive. How, do, how does that? How, how have you gone about doing that? And yeah, how does Instagram work? So not just not just Instagram, but like mm-hmm. an audience in general, mm-hmm. people that follow your work and are invested in what you do. I think that when I think about how I use my my presence on social media and how I'm engaging with the art community in Milwaukee, that it's about being generous, being curious. People are wondering, what is the process? How does this piece come to be? So on my Instagram profile, for example, I like to share images of how I'm making the art not just the polished finished product, but they get to see some of that behind the scenes action. They also get to see the things that I'm passionate and the things that I look at. And so when I go to an art museum, I'll oftentimes post a photo of, wow, this particular painting was very inspiring to me. And I'll share a paragraph or so on why it was inspiring and what I loved about it. If I'm reading a book or if I'm struck by a podcast that I thought was beautiful, sometimes I'll include a quote in a post. And so that way then I'm sharing the things that I love with people. And I think that there is a generosity there that people connect to that's authentic, that inspires that kind of engagement. That's what I love about following the people who I follow on Instagram. And I think anytime you can flip flop something like that. And so I can look at my followers and put myself in their shoes and think, well, what do they like about this experience? And then I can put myself in someone else's shoes and I can really think, what do I like about following folk fibers on on Instagram? Like, how is she informing me? And how can I share that same kind of information, but from my own point of view with other people? I think in terms of engaging with the art world, 
in Milwaukee, there's so many wonderful opportunities to do that. People are having art exhibitions and shows all the time. And the same way uh, being an artist and owning that title requires showing up and making art consistently. Being part of an art community means showing up and attending art exhibitions and art openings that I can't expect people to come to my opening mm-hmm. if I don't go to their opening, if I'm not engaged in the community and wondering what are people doing, what are they showing, what does the, the work look like? And so, for example, I have a show opening next week, Wednesday on the 15th at the Fister Hotel. I saw that. I went walk past mm-hmm. the Fister. Oh, good. Ask so you saw my quilts in the window. Yeah, I was very yeah. I was kind of about that. <laughs> So that show is curated by Pamela Anderson, and she's the current the current artist in residence yep. and future podcast guest. Hopefully, excellent. <laughs> yeah, put it out there. <laughs> so she curated a show that's eight female contemporary art abstract artists, and and I was honored to be asked to be in the show. And I think part of that goes back to I was an applicant to be one of the artists in residence. Ah. So I was one of six finalists, and ultimately they chose Pamela. But it was Pamela's third time applying. And she, by looking at her and her experiences with other artists in residence, for example, Timothy Westbrook is another Uh alumni of that program. And Pamela and Timothy did a collaboration together where they were using her paintings to print on fabric that he made as clothing for the opera and for other things. And that they're, they're working together and they're lifting one another up together and sharing about art together. So even though we were quote competitors in the artist residency, we were both had a lot in common because all six of us are artists in Milwaukee who wanted to work with the Fister. And so Pamela really encouraged all of us, and I I hope that we would have anyways, but she was so gregarious and wonderful that she encouraged us to look at one another as potential friends and colleagues and, and, and how can we lift one another up and share together. And so I actually ended up coming into Pamela's studio space for a while, and I was teaching yoga classes to the artists and and now kind of full circle Pamela is asking me to be in the exhibition and so it's a great example of how you know technically I guess I didn't get what I wanted because I wasn't chosen <laughs> as the Fister artist in residence but in in a lot of very important ways I did get what I wanted because I was able to exhibit at the finalist exhibition I was able to meet a lot of artists in Milwaukee and now I'm able to exhibit my work mm-hmm. in the, the pop-up gallery at the Fister Hotel. And I didn't even have to organize the <laughs> exhibition either. Yeah, nice. Pamela organized it, so it might even be more luxurious. Yeah. But just, I think, that having a spirit of generosity, a spirit, spirit of support, and that idea of consistently showing up and being involved in those things is an important part of of interacting, whether it's online or in person. That's great. So I, I pretty much already asked this question, but like getting integrated into a new community. So I've seen you and your work up all over the city, like at the Fester Hotel. Mm-hmm. That's very impressive in just one year to be new to the community. You, think it, you pretty much just answered that question, I feel like. But is there anything else you wanted to add to that? You know, I think that I chose Milwaukee for some pretty important reasons. And I think moving to a place that feels like it's the right place for you is very important. And so here in Milwaukee, we're very lucky to be near Cedarburg, and that is the home of the Wisconsin Museum of Quilts and Fiber Art. There is no Illinois Museum of Quilts or Fiber Art. Um, There are a couple important museums. There's one in Paducah, Kentucky. There's one in Lincoln, Nebraska. There's one in San Jose, California. Those are real hubs for fiber art, and there's maybe 10 of them. There's not a ton. And so... Being in a city that has a museum for fiber art is very important for me. I didn't realize that. mm -hmm. And they they have a beautiful exhibition on display right now. It's Stephen Graff's and Coverlets, so it's all weaving. And they have been an incredible resource to me. I've been a volunteer there since I moved. I am on the Adult Education Committee 
And I also was on the committee to help with the Spring University Days, just one of their fundraisers and a day where you can come in and take lots of classes. And so I helped recruit people like John Kowalczyk and Courtney Heimerl, who are in Milwaukee. I helped get them out to Cedarburg mm-hmm. so that they would be lecturers there. But Having that opportunity, again, just like I was saying on Instagram, where you think about what is it like to be the, you know, to play those two roles, the person providing the information and the person consuming the information, and how it's important to always try to see both sides of that seesaw. As a volunteer at the Quilt Museum, I get to see the other side. And so I get to see, well, how are they deciding which fiber artists to exhibit in the museum? How do they decide which artists to come and teach workshops and give lectures? And you know, what does the pricing look like? And what would a good application look like? I'm better able to put myself in, in the shoes of a quilt museum by literally working with a quilt museum. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I had to find out what's happening there. And so... That's been a wonderful experience, and I've taught a lot of classes and workshops there, and the president of the Quilt Museum was one of my letters of recommendation when I was applying for the Pfister Hotel Artist Residency, and again, I would just say, like, being involved and and putting myself out there, not being too shy, but realizing that I have something to offer and something to share And that I have a lot to learn and gain. So even though I'm a volunteer and I'm helping them, they're also helping me. And then I get to see what that kind of beautiful relationship is. So I think that I chose Milwaukee, definitely in part because of the Quilt Museum, because Mm -hmm. of that huge... I'm also part of the Midwest Fiber Arts Trail. And so that's... What's that? Uh, it's a wonderful resource. It's run by Jenny Wilder, and she's located, I believe, in Minnesota. And so it's the whole Midwest that she helps organize and put on events. And so I, it was just in March, we had the Cedarburg Spur, where there were about a dozen different fiber artists in different locations. And so you kind of got a passport, and you went around from each each artist's studio and you got to see what was happening there and you got to take classes. And so her newsletter has wonderful resources again about fiber art Mm -hmm. and sharing and lifting up people who are working in the medium that I work in. So that was another great resource to have here. I'm also a member of the Milwaukee Art Quilters Group. And so we meet, ironically, in Elm Grove in the suburbs, but we meet and get together and talk about quilts. And so through that group, I was able to exhibit in the Fine Furnishings show in Wauwatosa. And, you know, little by little, you find connections. And this was a wonderful city for me as a fiber artist to come to. Uh, the size of Milwaukee, like I said before, I just love how it feels living here. And I think when you have a genuine love for a place and a passion for a place that shows through, and you were talking before really about authenticity and how can you be authentic as an artist. And when I, I feel authentic in my love for Milwaukee and for engaging with the city and being here, that comes across as, as genuine because it is genuine and I think that, you know, living that that truth is really a huge part of why, why I've found success here in Milwaukee is because I'm genuinely excited to be here and <laughs> yeah. want to be involved in all these different things and want to know more and learn more about the community around me. Interesting. Now, I, I realize now that I haven't really talked about your work and the inspiration <laughs> behind your work and why you've chosen fibers <laughs> as to ceramics. Yeah. And like... Uh, 49 minutes in, I just wanted to give you a little chance to talk about that. A little five-minute blurb about my... my. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> you know, but isn't it funny that, that sometimes the medium doesn't matter as much as the art and the spirit mm-hmm. behind it? The work that I'm making right now that I'm the most excited about is a series that I've titled, I Know the Stars Are There Beyond the Clouds. And so it is a series of white quilts where I'm using bed sheets, white bed sheets, and I am very densely quilting the quilts. So they're about a quarter inch gap in the hand quilting. And the inspiration came very much from yoga because I also consistently teach yoga in the evenings and I'm still very engaged and and, um, inspired by my experience with yoga. And so in yoga, we talk a lot about repeatedly realigning that we want to align our values and our actions, and we want to get a little closer to 
uh, things that are true. And so in the winter, when I started the series, I would look up at the sky and it was all white because of the clouds. It was one of the, <laughs> one of the darkest winters uh, that I think we've ever had, even though it wasn't particularly cold this winter. It wasn't and particularly so, snowy either. No, it wasn't. It was just white sky every day. And I was reading a book that was mentioning the fact that the stars don't come out at night. Sometimes we say that, like, oh, the stars are out. Yeah. But in fact, the stars are always there. And it's just our ability to see them or to not see them. And so it's kind of, you know, that just reverse of the way that we use the language around the stars. And so during the day, right now, we look outside my window, we see a beautiful blue sky. Um, in the winter, we see a white sky. But beyond there, even though I can't prove it right now, I can't say to you, hey, look, there are stars right now. Um, but I can remind myself and I can know that the stars are still there, even though I can't see them. And I think that that's a beautiful metaphor that I connect to with yoga, with relationships, with the idea of just wanting to be a better person, really. And so you can see how that might move into an idea of a fear. And so fear that we were talking about earlier is, can I be an artist? Right? Is that a reasonable thing to think that I could make a living and live and be an artist? And you kind of unpack those fears and maybe make a list or a two-layered two list. And you think, well, it's hard, but it's possible. How do I know that? I see other artists out there making a living. So number one, other people can do it. Maybe I can do it. Then you think, all right, I went to art school. I love making art. I have experience. I think my art's pretty good. I've shown it to other people and had a critique and they've given me advice and helped me grow as an artist to become even more confident about my work. And so you have this list that you go through and then the next day you wake up and you're like, oh, but I'm afraid to be an artist. Yeah. <laughs> and then you go back to that list and you, you realign and you say, no, like, I have that fear, but it's not based in truth. It's not based in logic. And that's that same idea, for me at least, with the stars and the clouds. I look up and I don't see the stars. And it's possible to think, oh, they're gone. But actually, they're there. And I can use my brain and my memory to know that they're there. And so as I'm quilting on that quilt, I'm using applique. And I'm appliquing white stars on top of the white background. And then I hand quilt around the stars and I do several different kinds of hand quilting. So some of the hand quilting is in the direction of making a list. It's lines and it's that idea of list making. Other areas of the quilting are inspired by clouds and so it's very voluminous and there are lots of billowing shapes. And then finally there's an area that looks like constellations and so I'm making connections between the stars. And it was very important to me that I looked up neural neural, neural pathways plasticity. and also neural plasticity. <laughs> and so when you look that up online and do a Google image search, the neural pathways look very similar to constellations. You've got these two yeah. spheres and then the line connecting between them. Yeah. And so I, I like, like sort of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is similar to that. Definitely. Yeah. And so I liked that idea of the neural plasticity of making connections. As a yoga therapist, I talk all the time about the idea of a microcosm and a macrocosm, that our bodies are the way that the earth is. And so I think that that's a beautiful way to integrate that into my work, where when you really dig in, we're using the brain as a, we're using the stars and the clouds as a metaphor for the brain. And I'm looking at the constellations and I'm also at the same time looking at the way that our brain makes connections. And so, and then finally, I love that I'm using bed sheets to make the quilt. And so in bed is a huge time when we connect to the subconscious mind, uh, when we're dreaming or perhaps when we're figuring out who we're going to fall in love with, because that's a sort of <laughs> unconscious magic. You know, there, there's that yeah. je ne sais quoi. There's something very complicated about who do you fall in love with. That's not just one plus two equals three. Yeah. And so that's one of the things that first drew me to quilting. And one of the things that keeps me really engaged is that I can make meaning with the materials. And so 
you know, Mar- Mark Bradford, who I mentioned earlier, he's one of my favorite artists. I just love his work. And I love that he's making meaning by taking advertisements from the streets of Los Angeles and then using those advertisements to make a collage that is kind of map-like. And that's talking about more complicated ideas, even though his work looks abstract. And so I like that my work looks abstract, but then I have this literal hint because you can see that the fabric is a bed sheet that then it's like, oh, maybe it's about the subconscious. Maybe it's about relationships. And so, so that's the series that I'm working on now that I'm the most excited about. So I just want to make sure we got some more time. Mm-hmm. You're good with the timing because yeah. it's almost an hour and I've got a lot more questions. <laughs> okay. I'm going to try and respect your time. Um, yeah. And the viewers, listeners' yeah. time. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't really have a planned time schedule for this. This is more like a, a conversation that, like with Tim Ferriss, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that show. Mm-hmm. He doesn't really have a set time. Those can go on for a couple hours. But Excellent. Well, Cheers. Let's yeah. toast with our I don't want. I don't want to try to... <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to take up too much time, though. So each each episode mm-hmm. will be however long it is. Okay, that's that's the way yeah. the, world, the world works for me. <laughs> but yeah, so c- the contemporary art world is fascinating mm-hmm. to me. And I, you mentioned one of your one contemporary artist that mm-hmm. you're really inspired by. Who are some more contemporary artists? Oh gosh, now the podcast <laughs> is really going to get long. <laughs> just, just two or three, one um, or two. Yeah, so a couple artists that I like. I really love the work of Rebecca Carter. She was a graduate student when I was at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And so I had the opportunity to listen to her give you know, a lecture when she was doing her grad portfolio. And she was making these beautiful pieces where she created a fabric sale in her studio space. And so she used two dowel rods and then a long piece of fabric. And that piece of fabric would blow in the wind depending on when and how the air conditioning or the heating vent was on. And from that sail, she would tie a couple of Sharpie markers. And then underneath, she would put a piece of white paper. And as the sail blew, it would cause the Sharpie markers to either be still and have the ink spread out to create a big circle of ink, or it would cause them to move and create a thin little spider webby trail of mark making. And as she talked about that piece, she was talking very much about interacting with nature, that she felt like she was collaborating with the wind in the room, with the circumstances, and... I, I thought those drawings were stunning, and I'm sure they're still on her website if you look them up, but she was creating something beautiful, and she was using a minimal amount of effort, and she was working with nature rather than against it. So she was not the master of the universe. Mm-hmm. She was not doing a, a very fancy, specific line drawing that, that only she controlled. She was setting things up so that then she's collaborating. And I love that she, when she talked about her work, she was saying, and so now I have a lot of time in my studio since it takes me five minutes to set up my sale, that she was starting to read a lot of philosophy and she was starting to think a little deeper about the work and what it meant and why she was doing what she was doing so that she could speak articulately about her work. And that just felt like a very formative thing for me to hear her speak about. And then second, and I don't know if she, how to what extent she speaks about this element in her work or not, but that calls to mind the aesthetic of wabi-sabi. in Japanese art and the idea of the perfect mistake or the perfect accident. Wabi-sabi is very much about collaborating with nature, allowing things to happen. It's an art based on impermanence, um, things that are temporary. And that's an aesthetic that, that I truly love, that I see expressed beautifully in her work. And that I really make a lot of effort in my work to invite that in. It can be a little more difficult as a quilter to, to find ways to allow for things to happen, if that makes Mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. Um, there's certainly in quilting such a tradition of being very, very orderly and organized and planning and using math and cutting things and having, you know, I I do needlepoint and Mm -hmm. cross stitch and I, and a lot of this thing is just so orderly. You plan it all before. And I'm, I'm, I'm learning that Art is less overly than planned sometimes, mm-hmm. so I'm, I'm trying to stretch myself and work beyond that, but it's still hard to get to yeah, that point. Yeah, absolutely. And so 
In quilting, we actually have a distinction called improvisational. And so if you're an improvisational quilter, you allow things to happen while you're making the quilt Mm -hmm. rather than planning everything in advance. And so I piece my quilts improvisationally, but I also quilt improvisationally, which means that I am allowing, I, I don't use a pencil. I don't map things out in advance. I allow that quilting to occur naturally. So when I was talking about doing areas where there are lines and areas where there are neural pathways and areas where there are clouds billowing, those happen organically in the moment without a plan. But, you know, I, I'm always working to make sure that I'm staying true to that aesthetic of Wabi Sabi. And Rebecca Carter's art is one that I I just love because she's really, truly allowing things to happen and creating a space for her art to be created. And so for me, she exemplifies that aesthetic and is someone who I have looked to and been inspired by for a very long time. Okay, a couple more questions. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, Books. I love books about art and inspiration and stuff like that. So I'm just curious, what are some books that that inspire you, Mm -hmm. that you you love in the art world? For right now... Okay, so I read the book Art and Fear a few years ago, and mm-hmm. I recently wrote a blog post called Art and Fear, and I'm going to start rereading that book, because mm-hmm. we were talking about that in the conversation, too, yeah. about fear and art mm-hmm. and how they're intertwined. Yeah. And so what, what, what are some books like that for you? So actually, if you look to your right, I have a painting on the wall that I made as a collaboration with a friend, but I wrote on it the first two paragraphs of Marcel Proust's Remembrance of Things Past, and that is truly a book that's inspired me, and you're mentioning blogging. Back when I was, when I figured out that I liked quilting, a few months before that, I started blogging, and I was blogging about my paintings that I was making and the embroidery that I was doing, and then I found quilting, and I was blogging about that. And in that very important moment for me creatively, when I found a medium that I truly loved, I was reading that book, Marcel Proust's Remembrance of Things Past. It's a very long book. It's in seven parts. And so I listened to it as an audiobook. It was 40 discs. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Try to get that from the library, maybe. Mm-hmm. I Audible. Did, I did get it from the library. You know, and if you think of it as a month and a half of listening for one hour, that's really not no. so much. Um, you know, like I've listened to more than 40 podcasts, for yeah. sure. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. You should see my playlist. <laughs> <laughs> and so that book was written, you know, many years ago in France. And it continues to inspire me. And I love the idea of making art that's about memory. And the book is very much about memory. And it's how all of the senses are connected to memory. So once you get into page 50, there's a beautiful moment where he's eating a Madeline cookie. And the experience of eating that cookie and the taste and the way it mixes with the tea that he's drinking takes him back to a moment in childhood that he hadn't thought about for years. And it's just, it's one of the most beautiful books that I've ever read. It's so, for me, inspiring because it reminds me of what I love about art Mm -hmm. and that magic that happens when you're looking at a beautiful work of art and it touches your soul, it touches your heart. And that's what I'm hoping to do as an, you know, humbly hoping to do, um, is to make work that touches a person's heart the way that Proust was able to touch my heart. And so the piece that I'm making about the stars and the clouds, that is a a work of art that's about memory. I'm remembering that the stars are there when I only see clouds. And I'm using something tactile like a bed sheet to connect in that way. And so... It's my love of Proust's book about memory, truly, that inspired me to make art that's also about memory in the most powerful way that I can work. And I'm trying to to push deeper to really see, like, how can I get at this idea? Because saying you make art about memory is very vague sometimes. It's very woo-woo. And Proust does it in this way that's very specific and very beautiful. And so I'm hoping also to be very specific in the ways that I'm referencing memory. And so another book that inspires me a huge amount is also by a French author, author, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, wrote The Little Prince. Mm -hmm. And The Little Prince just inspires me 
so much. I've named a couple of my quilts after The Little Prince. There's a recent piece, one that's at the Fister right now, called Tame Me, Please. Oh. And if you recall, the fox wants the little boy to tame him. And the way that you get tamed is you show up consistently, right? Just yeah. like I'm talking about how you can be an artist, how you can be part of a community. Um, this, the fox is saying, you know, please show up every day at the same time and allow me to trust you and allow me to know you. And when that happens... I'll see the golden waves of grain in the landscape and I will think of you and your blonde hair even when you're not around. And to me, that's beautiful. And it's also about time and it's about memory, which are the things that I as an artist am very excited about exploring. And so again, that beautiful book helps give me a way into these very complicated topics. And then another work of art is a series that I'm doing called Night Flight. And it's about flying and looking out the window at night and seeing the landscape and the lights from below. And Exuperia also wrote a book called Night Flight. And so that was the source of the title for that series was in reference to his passion for flying, the way that he was so inspired by flight, but also the fact that he died when he was flying during World War II. I forgot that. And... Um, you know, so there's that bittersweet quality. And I think flight for me is such a magical experience. There's so much beauty in it, but there's also culturally a lot of darkness. There's a lot of fear of terrorism. There's a lot of fear of flying in general. And I think that the medium that I'm working in being a quilt, quilts are inherently comforting. They're There's a lot of ideas that I can get at with a quilt, but there's some things that in every quilt they're present. And that idea of comfort and the idea of time spent um, are always there. And so I like the idea that my work about flying is in a material that's inherently comforting and can hopefully, uh, you know, share some of that joy that I feel for art with others. And certainly I remember when I was a very young kid being extremely inspired by Georgia O'Keeffe's paintings of the clouds, Uh, in particular the huge painting that was at the Art Institute of Chicago, because we would go there fairly often. And I remember thinking, wow, this artist loves flying so much that she made a painting of flying. I can't wait till I get to go in an airplane and fly and look out the window. And so I never had time to be afraid of flying or to develop a fear of flying because of that work of art and the passion that she had behind flight. So anyways, those are two books okay. that have inspired me. So I thought of my last, qu- I, I, okay, my last, uh, after I asked my last question, I want to, um, you give a chance to share w- what you're working on and mm-hmm. where people can follow you mm-hmm. and find you online. Before that, I want to ask you, offer this question to you, the name of my podcast is The Curious Artist. Mm-hmm. So as an artist, what are you curious about now? Mm. So I am you know, I think even that story about the work that I'm, the, the piece that I'm making now, um, that came from being curious about relationships and about uh, neural pathways. And so I was reading a book at the time that was called Getting the Love You Want. And that was recommended to me for creating more conscious relationships. Um both romantically and also the the part of the reason why I was reading it was just for friendships and for interacting with family members and loved ones. And so I was curious about that topic of the conscious versus the unconscious. And in reading the book on page six, they had that line. We talk about the stars as though they come out, but actually they're always there. And they were referring to the subconscious mind as endless and infinite and and more complex than we can ever imagine. And so they use the analogy saying that we think we see all the stars in the city at night, but if you go to the country, there are so many more stars. And if it's a clear night, there are even more stars. And then you use a telescope and you realize, wow, there's a lot going on out there. And they said that the con- the unconscious mind is that big and that complicated. And once in a while, we get a glimpse into why we do the things we do and how our unconscious mind works. But that is definitely something that I'm currently curious about and that I'm excited to share my curiosity for that topic 
in my art in general. And so I finished reading that book. I've also been very excited about the concept of being a highly sensitive person. And I think that you yeah, saw me those... post about that yeah. on Facebook and we're both highly sensitive people. Um, that's in a book written by Elaine Aaron. And so a couple of years ago, I read The Highly Sensitive Person. And that's also part of what inspired me to decide to leave teaching was that I was just being bombarded by 150 people needing and wanting things every day. And it made it hard to keep my life balanced. And I realized that as a highly sensitive person, life felt better when I could have more time to be alone or to be in a small group. And so I, um, I'm one chapter away from finishing the highly sensitive person <laughs> in love. And so that's been very revealing too, because it's also more about relationships in general, about healing our relationships with our parents, about, um, you know, who, who do you look for and what kind of relationships can be positive or how can we interact with others? So it's, I've been very pleasantly impressed how much it's also about friendships and about family, as well as it's about romance. Um, you know, it's not the highly sensitive person's book about relationships. It's the highly person. It's the the HSP (laughs) in love and in all of the different forms that love can be and can relate to. And so that's been very revealing to me and making me think more about what are things like from my point of view and from someone else's point of view. And as I'm forming relationships, yes, it can be nice and cozy to be in a relationship with someone who seems just like me, Mm -hmm. uh, especially as she's filling out about a relationship between two highly sensitive people. But she says, you know, there's a lot to be gained in a relationship where one person's highly sensitive and the other person isn't. And how when you have two different personalities in a relationship, you can really learn a lot from one another. And when you live with someone who's different from you, rather than getting lost in those things that you have the same and being bewildered by everything that's different, you, you live with someone who's constantly saying, "Eh, I don't really see it the way that you see it. Like my experience is different from your experience. And that creates more to learn that you get a broader, richer human experience by spending time with people who are different from you. So that's certainly something that I'm very feeling curious about now. And I'm also so excited to decide what book will I read next yeah, I love since books. I only have one chapter left. Oh, um, but I love yeah. and hate that feeling. <laughs> you should check out this book. Someone recommended mm-hmm. me. You wouldn't think it's about art, but it is. It's called Lynchpin by Seth Godin. I have, I'm, I love Seth Godin. I love Seth Godin. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever heard of Lynchpin? Um, yes, actually, when I was a teacher, my department chair told us about linchpin, and we actually, for the whole school year, we passed around a linchpin, and at each department meeting, we would share and say, you know, for me, Steve is a linchpin in the department because he helps me with this and that, and this, you know, his his yeah. role that lifts everyone up is X, and then the next week, Steve would choose like. Yeah. Carol and he would say Carol is a linchpin in our department yeah. because she does that. So yeah, yeah I have not read it, but I oh, know yeah, of I would it, really recommend it because in it he talks about the artist being an artist is being a linchpin, being a linchpin is being an artist, and how art like all about what art is and the, the resistance and how mm-hmm. to be an artist. And there's mm-hmm. no map; you got to make your own map. So if, if you have if you haven't read that one, I would highly recommend that book. Yeah. I, I got it from the library. Mm-hmm. I loved it so much. I got it from Barnes and Noble and highlighted like every single page. Uh, <laughs> I know I can't read library books on paper because I'm I know. always highlighting. So I yeah, to- Seth Godin. He did a wonderful podcast interview with On Being. Yeah, and the way that he talked about finding your tribe, I yes. found very powerful. And I think that that is another answer to your questions about how have I found success in Milwaukee and online is I'm not trying to get everyone to know about my art. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to find my tribe. Like, who are my people who are interested in... Because another thing I'm I'm very interested in that we didn't get around to is mending and repairing clothing. And um, it's... The clothing industry is the number two most polluting industry Mm -hmm. on the planet. And there's so many easy things that we can do to reduce that carbon footprint. Yeah. If we even look 10, 20 years ago, 
that was not the case. It's a recent boom yeah. that's happened in fabric, and it's something that we have the power to change and reduce. And one of those ways is by mending clothing. And so that's been a yeah, great thing for me to, to find. Do that. Yeah, to find like-minded people. Um, you know, people who are also excited about the environment and who want to have, you know, a few clothes that last rather than going out and wasting your time buying new clothes all the time. <laughs> or go, yeah, what I do is I go to Value Village because mm-hmm. I'm right now I'm losing weight. So I've I've lost almost three pant sizes now. Mm-hmm. I've lost, well, I've lost three pants sizes. This is my second. I just bought these pants at Value Village like less than a month ago. Cool. Oh, and yeah, they they're fit. already a little loose. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a huge... Uh, huge thing to do is buying used instead of There's buying new. There's no point new. in buying new pants because mm-hmm. I'm going to shrink out of them eventually. <laughs> and you know, pe- people donate clothes a lot, but I think that they're not aware that only 5% of those clothes are resold within oh, America. Really? And 95% of those clothes are shipped overseas and given to other people and other places or go in landfills and... Um, it's important. We need more people to shop used and yeah. to, to repurpose clothing in that way. So that's, yeah. that's amazing that you're doing that. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. And then the last, uh, a few different questions. Oh, I, I, I hate to end this interview, yeah. but, <laughs> but I, I feel like I would probably share going. Um, mm-hmm. So where can people find you online? What can they do to follow you? What can they do to support you right now? Thank you. Yeah. So I have a website that is HeidiParks.com. Parks is spelled K-E-S. I'm sure that'll be in the show notes. Um, And so on my website, I have some really polished looking photos of my quilts. I have links to things that I'm doing. And there's a link to my Instagram. My Instagram account is the place where I'm the most active online. And that is Heidi.Parks on Instagram. And I would love to connect with you guys there. I always reply to my comments and questions. And so I I see it as a very interactive source and somewhere where I show a lot of photos of in-progress works and and connecting with other quilters and other artists. I will be teaching in February at QuiltCon in Savannah, Georgia. And so if you go to the Modern Quilt Guild's website, you can find details about taking classes and workshops there. I have a mending class coming up soon, both at Permanent Baggage on the east side in Milwaukee and at Wild Haven in Bayview in Milwaukee. So if you want to learn how to mend your clothing, those now, would be great places. Now, probably not going to be coming out till July. That's, that's cool. That's what I plan on Yeah, my so that's happening in July. And in August, I'll be teaching a class on how to mend your quilts at the Quilt Museum in Cedarburg, and also a quilting series that I'll be doing every Wednesday during the afternoon at the Quilt Museum during August and September. So lots going on and definitely always easy to connect at the website. Well, thank you very much. It's been a great conversation. Thank you, Carly. This was wonderful. I really enjoyed talking with you also. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you would like to support The Curious Artist Show, please share it with a friend or someone you think would enjoy it. Thanks again. Have a nice day.